Our next presenter is Alan Tolley. Alan is a charter member of the league and has served as an issue editor for many years to over the front as well. And anyone who read the most recent winter issue of Over the Front uh, knows the meticulous and detailed approach Alan brings to the table with his research. And he joins us this morning to, uh, to further examine the life and death of one of America's most well-known figures from the Great War, Quentin Roosevelt. Alan? Thank you. Um, about uh, 20 years ago, uh, a neighbor boy of our family was getting married. And uh, so we were invited to the wedding and uh, my daughter decided to bring her boyfriend along to the wedding. So uh, when we arrived at the church, this was a full dress wedding, you know, nothing cheap or anything. We got out of the car and when uh, my future son-in-law got out of the car, we saw that he had on two different kinds of shoes. He had on a brown wingtip shoe and a, and a black captive shoe. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was too late to turn back at that point, so he had to tough it out for the rest of the day in reception. But uh, that's kind of a lot like uh, doing research in aviation history. Uh, it's a uh, some philosophers look at a certain type of knowledge as being something you can uh, arrange like shoes in your closet. And, uh, of course, if you don't have them lined up right, you can reach in there and get the wrong thing at the wrong time and so forth. So we do a lot of that kind of uh, stuff in our study. But uh, today, uh, I'm going to depart from that, and I'm not going to slog through all the uh, the article that I wrote in uh, chronological order and, and so forth. <clears throat> I'm going to treat it more like uh, picking up throw rugs or something that are all different uh, sizes and shapes. And uh, I'll take them out of order and uh, presume that uh, since you're all members of the society, you've uh, uh, read the uh, or looked at the winter issue and you know as much about the subject as probably you want to know. There we go. Um, when uh, America uh, declared war, that was in April 1917, uh, Quentin Roosevelt was a, a student at Harvard, and like many of uh, his uh, fellow students, he quit school right away. Uh, within uh, days, uh, less than a week, and uh, made arrangements to take a physical examination for the Air Service. So he traveled down to uh, Washington, D.C., uh, and along with other uh, aspirants, uh, took a physical examination and he, and he passed it, uh, much to the dismay of uh, some people because he had a couple of uh, dislocated ribs and, and uh, very poor eyesight. <laughs> but um, he passed it and he had orders to uh, Hazelhurst Field, or at, at that time it was called Mineola uh, because it was located just outside of the uh, village of Mineola, which is uh, to the right of this, uh, to your left of uh, this uh, photograph. Uh, Quentin was uh, in one of the, or he was in the uh, very first class of uh, actual cadets for the Air Service, and uh, it was a, a pretty disorganized uh, place when he arrived there. It had been uh, the field of the New York National Guard. Uh, this uh, photograph was taken in 1918, so it had uh, changed a lot. Uh, when Quentin was there, uh, all these buildings uh, were not in existence. Uh, what they had was uh, hangers like this. There were five in those days here, and then there was another 15 located here. Uh, and those were the hangers of the uh, New York uh, National Guard. So our, our, my study of uh, Mineola uh, is a work in progress. I, I avoided that in my article 
because I didn't know anything about it and uh, it was kind of outside of the scope. But uh, what I know about it uh, at the present is more by inference. We don't really have a narrative yet of uh, Quentin's experience there. Oops, uh, Uh, here is how uh, the flight line looked uh, when it was still a National Guard uh, operation. Uh, the hangars had uh, placards on the, the top of them that actually had the serial numbers of the airplanes that are lined up there. So um, I've been able to establish that the airplanes that they had were uh, Curtis JN-4 and JN-4Bs. And they're all from old production uh, orders that were placed uh, at the end of 1916 and had been already used by the National Guard. In fact, uh, some of these airplanes in the original photograph, you can see a star insignia under the wing, which is a red star on a white disc. And that was uh, apparently the uh, marking of the New York National Guard. But uh, uh, Quentin and his uh, cohorts uh, started training there in May of 1917. And uh, that was uh, exactly the time when uh, the Army changed the name from Mineola and gave it the name Hazelhurst Field. And that's also the time when, when the, uh, the new uh, national insignia starts to appear uh, on uh, the planes of the uh, Air Service. Uh, this uh, plane on the top, um, I believe that is the plane that was uh, flown by Captain Ralph Taylor. Uh, he was killed on the 2nd of August, 1917, and that was uh, already uh, more than a week since uh, Quentin uh, sailed for France. So uh, Quentin wasn't there at, at the time of that wreck, but uh, uh, that's probably one of the airplanes that Quentin used, and uh, uh, Captain Taylor was probably one of uh, Quentin's uh, instructors. Uh, Hiram Bingham, the uh, famous explorer of uh, South America, uh, and who was later the uh, commanding officer at Issoudan in the last half of 1918, had gone to Mineola uh, in the last part of July 1917 to finish his flying lessons, and, uh, and he was uh, slated to be the next passenger in this airplane, this crashed airplane. Uh, if it had to crash, he, he would have been the next student to take it up. So he kind of uh, dodged the bullet, I guess. Now, a, a French uh, military mission came to uh, the United States. Uh, they arrived at the end of, of April, and uh, newspaper reports and so forth indicate that they were in the New York area in the first week of May. And uh, I have uh, several photographs showing uh, uh, French officers crawling over uh, a JN-4B. Uh, and uh, these pictures uh, seem to have been taken at the same time, uh, pro probably the same day. So um, you notice that the, uh, uh, this uh, JN-4B has the stars on the wings, but I have photographs of that same airplane without any markings uh, whatsoever, one of us, a uh, National Guard plane. And uh, this uh, photo here, uh, this plane, number six, 167, is that one right there. And you can see they're uh, doing construction on some new hangars. But these uh, airplanes don't have any markings on them at all. So that, that pins down the point in time when uh, the new markings came into effect. Uh, here's a group of uh, six Harvard men who were in Quentin's class. Uh, 
Quentin was uh, younger than all of them. Uh, they were in the class of uh, uh, 1915, and they're uh, an interesting bunch. Of course, uh, that's Quentin right there. Uh, this uh, guy here is uh, John Hopkinson Baker, and he later became the president of the Audubon Society, and he's uh, given credit for saving the Everglades here in Florida. Uh, this uh, gentleman is uh, Roderick Tower. Uh, his uh, father was Charlemagne Tower, who was the U.S. ambassador to Russia when uh, Theodore Roosevelt was president. He was also ambassador to Austria-Hungary, and he was uh, also ambassador to Germany. And uh, his son Roderick uh, figures in our story, uh, to be and not to be, uh, he, was, he was the one who actually married Flora Payne Whitney, who was Quentin's fiance until he was killed. So, uh, Flora and uh, Roderick had two children, uh, but uh, he was an uh, unfaithful husband and uh, alcoholic. Uh, they uh, divorced in uh, 1925. Uh, she married again and had two more children and a long, happy marriage. And uh, she followed in her mother's uh, footsteps and she became the president and chairman of the, Ameri of the Whitney Museum of American Art. Uh, and uh, became a friend of Jackie Kennedy and had a very distinguished life. Um, this, uh, this photograph of her, uh, if you look closely uh, toward my side, uh, you can see a couple of uh, army uniforms of officers there. So I, I, I'm not sure when that photograph was taken. It, it may have been when uh, uh, Quentin was still there or it, it could have been uh, somewhat later. Um, back to our uh, story, uh, Flora's mother was uh, Gertrude Vanderbilt, and uh, her grandfather was Cornelius Vanderbilt. So Flora was uh, the potential heiress of one of America's biggest fortunes. Uh, on the other hand, Quentin was uh, a potential heir to take the, on the mantle of America's greatest progressive politician. And those, uh, those two different uh, backgrounds, uh, although they're both wealthy, uh, they kind of mix like oil and water. And uh, they happened to uh, meet when uh, uh, Flora had her debutante's ball and uh, uh, 500 people were invited and uh, they constructed a whole new pavilion to uh, put on the uh, celebration. Quentin ended up as her escort to that uh, affair and they fell in love. And uh, when Quentin went back to Harvard in the fall of 1916, uh, they continued uh, their relationship and uh, their love was uh, uh, it just uh, developed and uh, so when uh, Quentin went down to Washington DC to uh, enlist in the air service uh, sometime around there he proposed marriage to her and uh, by the, the middle of May she accepted so uh, now what do they do uh, they know what their parents would think about this. Both, both sides would uh, uh, be very uh, uneasy with uh, them getting married. So they kept a, a secret for the time being. Uh, in the meantime, Quentin continued to uh, train as an aviator at, uh, at the, the Mineola field. And uh, he was 
uh, within, uh, I don't know, 10 miles or 15 miles of their Roosevelt home at Sagamore Hill. And he was all at, all, also in proximity to uh, Flora's uh, home on Long Island. So they uh, saw a lot of each other during that period, and Quentin could go home, he could commute to uh, his uh, training as an aviator, uh, go home at night. So at the end of June 1917, Quentin passed his uh, test for reserve military aviator, and uh, on the 6th of July, he was commissioned the first lieutenant. Um, actually, he was commissioned ahead of those other five guys in the previous photograph. Uh, <coughs> uh, unlike uh, how it would be, how would he, I would expect it to be today, a, a class of cadets, they'd all get commissioned in one ceremony. But, but in this case, they, the other cadets were commissioned uh, anywhere from a week to a month after Quentin. And so, uh, quickly, Quentin uh, received orders to report to Fort Wood and a report to Captain James Miller uh, and with the expectation of uh, being shipped to France. Uh, so this photo here, Quentin is wearing his lieutenant's uniform. So uh, that would have to be uh, taken w within the last week of when he and Flora would uh, ever see each other. Uh, when uh, Quentin sailed, uh, uh, the Whitney yacht was uh, moored down and at the pier near where uh, Quentin's ship was sailing, and uh, the, the Whitney, uh, Flora's uh, parents uh, were present uh, that day, along with the Roosevelt's, when the ship sailed. This uh, uh, other photo is the photo that the actual photo that Quentin carried with him to France, and it was stuck in his uh, prayer book. Uh, so the in the days and uh, weeks and months uh, after Quentin went to France, uh, Theodore Roosevelt uh, tried to promote them getting married as soon as possible. Uh, he uh, called on the Whitney's. Uh, he went to uh, Flora's mother's uh, art studio in Manhattan, uh, and he tried to arrange uh, one way or another to get Flora to France so they could get married. Uh, but uh, Pershing was putting the brakes on uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, he didn't want uh, wives to go over to France, and uh, uh, Flora's uh, brother was uh, a cadet aviator also, uh, down in Texas, and sisters of uh, military personnel were not allowed to go to France. And uh, neither were minors, and she was still not 21 years old. So she had three strikes against her uh, to get to France, and uh, then too, Quentin was uh, gradually, as, as uh, once, you, once you get in the service and you're in a unit someplace, What's going on at home tends to uh, fade into the distance, and you're more concentrated on your life as uh, whatever it is, a sergeant or a lieutenant or anything. And uh, so Quentin was uh, reluctant to have her come over there, so it never happened. Um, is uh, Bill Jackson here? There you are. I want to thank you for uh, tipping me off about uh, Warwick Green. Uh, he, he is uh, someone I had never heard of, uh, but yet he is, uh, in my opinion, one of the most important people. Uh, in Quentin's life, you know, in a certain perverse way. Uh, he was a, a Harvard man, too. Uh, he was in the class of 1901, 
but uh, before that, he had, uh, even though his uh, father and grandfather were generals in the army, he enlisted in the Navy as a seaman, and he served on the yacht Yankee, which uh, was engaged in some activities off the coast of Cuba in the Spanish-American War. Uh, after that, he uh, went back to Harvard, and he obtained a law degree in 1906. And instead of going on Wall Street, he went to the Philippine Islands, and uh, he went to work for the governor of the Philippines, and he became the commissioner of public works for the Philippine Islands. Um, in the process of, of that, he got to know a whole lot of uh, United States Army officers who were running the place, uh, including uh, General Pershing, and in, including uh, Pershing's uh, future uh, aide-de-camp in 1918, uh, Edward Bowditch. Uh, he was also uh, captain of the uh, uh, Manila Polo team in 1913 and 1914. But uh, in 1916, he uh, came back to the United States and he went to work for the Rockefeller Relief Organization and uh, traveled to France and uh, worked in that capacity for about a year. And then when uh, uh, Colonel Bowling came over there. Uh, he uh, went to work for uh, Bowling, or, or excuse me, he back up. He went uh, first to work for the Red Cross, for the American Red Cross, for a couple of months, and then went to work for Bowling in uh, August 1917 as uh, Bowling's executive assistant. And he was a, a civilian at that time but he had uh, offices and an office staff in Paris, so he uh, turned over his office in the whole bailiwick to the use of uh, Colonel Bowling. Uh, eventually, he uh, received a commission as a major, but uh, you can uh, imagine uh, my surprise uh, when we see him here sitting with that dog, he's got captain's bars on his shoulder. He's sitting right right between Warwick Green, excuse me, he's sitting right between uh, Quentin Roosevelt and Colonel Bowling. Now this, this photograph has been uh, published time and time again, and uh, no one has ever, uh, until I came along, uh, tried to figure out who are these guys and what are they doing. Um, but um, when I saw Warwick Green in that picture, it, it suddenly became clear to me uh, that that's Bowling sitting there. And uh, uh, Bowling had uh, come down to uh, Isidon on a, on a trip and so we know the date when uh, Bowling was there, which was the 17th and 18th of September, 1917. But uh, to understand what's going on, we have to uh, go back in time to 1906, when uh, Theodore Roosevelt was president. He promoted Pershing from captain to brigadier general and he jumped over uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 864 <laughs> regular army officers that were senior to him. So you can see that Pershing had a, a debt to pay to Theodore Roosevelt. And um, it, it took him a while to get it paid off, but when uh, jumping forward again, when uh, Quentin's older brothers went to France, uh, Archie and Ted, they went as casual officers and they had orders to report directly to General Pershing, which usually doesn't happen to reserve lieutenants and majors. 
So they uh, reported to Pershing in Paris, and he, Pershing says, well, what do you want to do? And they said, well, we want to be with the troops facing the enemy, words to that effect. And Pershing said, okay, I'm assigning you to the 1st Infantry Division. Well, the 1st Infantry Division was like Pershing's own. They're the regular army. They're the cream of the crop of uh, the American military, and they're just arriving in France. So that's where they went. Um, a little later, Quentin arrived in France, and he's in this detachment under Captain Miller. Well, he does not re uh, report to Pershing. Instead, they need a supply officer down at Issoudan, where they're just starting construction on this new camp. So, Quentin's it. He's the supply officer. And uh, so he uh, goes down there, and uh, three weeks later, he, his uh, commanding officer, uh, Major uh, Churchill, says, you have orders to report to the 1st Aero Squadron. Right out of the blue. Uh, orders to report to the 1st Aero Squadron, which was also just arriving in France. And this was also the Aero Squadron that served on the Mexican border <coughs> under Pershing. So, um, there's no uh, uh, link that I have been able to find uh, as to who wrote that order. But uh, at the time, Bowling was in command of uh, what they call the line of communication, which was all the supply, all the training, uh, all the railroads, the ports, and uh, procurement of stuff. Bowling is in charge of that. Mitchell. Uh, Colonel Mitchell is in charge of the zone of advance of the air service. So uh, Mitchell would not have the authority to give uh, Quentin orders to report to him. And Bowling, it wouldn't be his, in his interest to have Quentin, because he wanted Quentin in his organization. He didn't want to turn him over to Mitchell. So the order uh, for Quentin to join the 1st Aero Squadron uh, had to have come from somewhere on Pershing's staff. So I think my personal opinion is that uh, Pershing's fingerprints are all over that, but it hasn't turned up yet. Nonetheless, uh, so Quentin uh, uh, assumed he was going to the 1st Aero Squadron, but he had a trip to make to Paris on the supply business, and when he got back, Major Churchill meets him at the station with his car, and on, when they're driving back out to the, uh, the base, uh, Churchill says, you, you don't really want to go out with that first Aero Squadron. They're a bunch of elite guys, and you know, you're just going to be a low man on a totem pole, and, and uh, that's not going to do you any good. You need to stay here and get more experience as a supply officer that's worth something. And uh, in the meantime, you can get uh, some flying in, and, and then, then we'll send you out to the front. Well, um, he, he, he uh, completed that conversation by saying that uh, uh, Colonel Bowling is down here at camp, and he agrees with me. No kidding. Well, so the next morning, they get together, and here they are. This is their meeting. So you've got, you've got a case where Quentin, he's, he's uh, nobody knows it yet, but uh, he's going to be called a hero, and the heroes get a call to action a lot of times. And Quentin, that order to the 1st Aero Squadron was his call to action. And uh, heroes, lots of times in uh, various stories, refuse that call to action. And here's Quentin refusing that call to action. These guys are selling him a bill of goods. Uh, uh, when I was in the Marine Corps, uh, 
my roommate at one time was an ex-enlisted man, and, and he used to, when, when he heard somebody make a banal argument, he would say, well, that sounds like a sergeant trying to get a corporal to ship over, which means is a euphemism for re-enlist. And, and that's what uh, Bowling and uh, Warwick Green are doing here. They're uh, talking, talking him out of it, and, and he's, Quinn says, okay. But from then on, uh, that is a, a major turning point in my way of thinking, the major turning point in his whole career in France until he was killed. Because um, his father uh, didn't, uh, didn't expect him to go over to France and became a supply, become a supply officer. You, you can imagine what, what if uh, uh, Pershing had asked uh, Ted Roosevelt, what do you want to do? And he would have said, I, I, I think I could serve best in uh, the procurement department, contracting officer department or something like that. Um, no, it's not going to be that way. Um, so these, these uh, guys, Warwick Green and uh, Bowling, are in the life of a a hero. They're the gatekeepers that along the way try to keep the hero from moving to the next stage. And, uh, and the effects, you have to look at the effects of uh, that action. Now I, I'm recently in uh, touch with a, an author who's writing about the love story of uh, Flora and Quentin. And he's uh, writing a serious book. And, uh, he, he doesn't. He doesn't see my point here, and I tell him uh, it isn't the banality of of the uh, argument not to uh, advance, but it's the effect that you have to look at. Now, uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, in a speech he gave in 1910, he said, "The credit belongs to the man who is actually." in the arena whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood. That's what he said. And uh, uh, later, uh, when Quentin was at Isidon, he was interviewed by a visiting uh, dignitary uh, who said, Lieutenant, there are large numbers of Americans who are very proud of the way the four sons of Theodore Roosevelt are acquitting themselves in this war. He continued, I shall never forget how his face lighted up when he made this reply. Quentin said, well, you know it's rather up to us to practice what Father preaches. Yeah. <laughs> so, but he just uh, refused to call. So in the same letter that he's explaining this to his family, he starts using uh, he, uh, the word embusqué. Embusqué is the French word for shirker. And uh, uh, Quentin says words to the effect that, well, they've promised to send me out to the front in three months and then I won't be embusqué. And in the next eight months, over the next eight months, Quentin uses that term over and over again in his letters. And he's, he's denying that he's, you know, that he's kind of inoculating himself against that word. And then he's, every time he makes a, a projection, like three weeks are gonna send me to a French squadron, or three weeks are gonna, from now they're gonna send me to a British squadron, or in two weeks I'm going to gunnery school, or something like that. And that three weeks keeps extending out and extending out. And he turns into eight months, and he's in this predicament. Um, in my article, I, I mentioned uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, the uh, existential philosopher, uh, who pointed out that uh, a person is remembered for what they actually do not for what they think they would do. If, if you think, oh, in that case, if I were faced with that, I would act in this way or that way. 
No, what, what you're going to be remembered for is, is how you act when you do get in that situation. Uh, so Quinn was in that existential predicament, and that's the way I look at it. And um, I talked about consequences. The consequences did occur. In February 1918, uh, Quint's brothers, they're out in the tool sector sitting in the trenches in the cold and the snow. And they're fed up with Quentin talking about how he's you know, going to get sent out here and there. And so they wrote, uh, Archie wrote a letter back to his sister, Ethel, accusing Quentin of being a shirker. And uh, the crap really hit the fan in the family. Uh, telegrams started flying back and forth, letters, uh, telephone calls. Uh, uh, people were furious, including uh, Quentin's fiance, uh, his sister, his whole family were furious about this accusation. and. and uh, they uh, worked to try to tamp that down and uh, get Quentin calmed down because he was uh, very upset himself. So the consequences of this act um, were far-reaching. Uh, the life of a hero is uh, often touched in the form of a wise old woman. And Quentin was uh, no exception. And his wise old woman was uh, Miss Irene Given Wilson. Uh, not only was she acquainted with his fiancee, Flora, uh, but they had gone together to the Roosevelt's house at Sagamore Hill and dined with uh, Colonel Roosevelt and uh, Edith. And I'm sure. Uh, that uh, when she appeared at Isidon in uh, October 1917, you can imagine the possibilities of uh, misunderstandings and, uh, and all kinds of complications that could arise out of that. Um, but uh, that wasn't, uh, well, uh, let me back up and say that uh, when uh, Miss Given Wilson uh, went to Isidon, she was in charge of the American Red Cross detachment. Uh, they weren't, they, this is not the hospital, but this is the uh, organization that runs the uh, canteen there at Isidon. Um, well, she was born in 1876, and uh, she was educated in London, at the uh, University of London. Uh, afterwards, she went to Bonn, Germany, and attended a, uh, a school that taught nursing for uh, volunteers. And she went to Holland and uh, uh, studied further there, and then uh, came to the United States and somehow became acquainted with Flora. And in uh, 1915, she was working at the Presbyterian Hospital in New York City, where uh, the person who was uh, the superintendent there was uh, uh, Miss Maxwell. Uh, and uh, so in 1916, uh, Miss Gibbon Wilson and Miss Maxwell went to Europe and uh, they visited uh, 64 hospitals in uh, England, in Belgium, and in France. And uh, then when they came back, uh, Miss Given Wilson wrote a uh, report on uh, how these uh, voluntary uh, aid organizations were working over there and, and so forth. So, so that would have been uh, of great interest to Theodore Roosevelt when she visited their, their home. But um, uh, I was interested in uh, uh, Anna Maxwell, who was uh, the lady who was uh, in charge of the hospital nursing in New York. Uh, she had uh, 
been a nurse in the Spanish-American War, and uh, she was the uh, one who was most instrumental in setting up the U.S. Army Nursing Corps. And uh, uh, so uh, she became uh, a friend of Miss Gibbon Wilson, and when uh, Anna Maxwell died in 1929, she was the first woman ever buried in Arlington National Cemetery with full military honors. So um, Miss Gibbon Wilson uh, moved and, you know, she had influential friends. Uh, here she's chatting with uh, General Pershing and Secretary Newton, Secretary of War Newton Baker. And uh, it looks like she's holding her own, more than holding her own. <laughs> <laughs> with those guys. Well, well now I'm, I'm going to um, ask uh, for some help here from uh, Nanette O'Neill, who is going to uh, read a couple of letters that Miss Gibbon Wilson wrote to Quentin's mother after Quentin was killed. Whoops, what's going on? Go back one. There we go. July 6, 1919. Dear Mrs. Roosevelt, I thought you might like to have this little picture of the cozy corner in my room at Isidon, where Quentin used to love to stretch himself out in the evening while I read to him from his book of verse. I sat on the low chair by the couch with Ham, lay stretched out on a chaise lounge which does not show in the picture. Many a winter evening did they spend there, reading to themselves, if I were too busy to be with them. I only wish they were in the picture instead of myself. The anniversary of his death is approaching and will, I know, bring you sad thoughts. But the memory of his spirit is always happy and joyous. The worse the conditions in camp, the higher his buoyancy. He was simply wonderful. I have just returned from a short visit in Was to Washington, which I was not fortunate in enough to find Mrs. Longworth there. Everyone seems to be out of town until the Congress reassembles. However, I won't despair of finding work sooner or later. With kindest regards, yours very sincerely, Irene M. Gibbon Wilson. from the American Red Cross, July 20th, 1918. Dear Mrs. Roosevelt, the last three days I have been hoping against hope that the news of Quentin may be proven false or that he might at any rate be still living, although a prisoner. I went to aviation headquarters yesterday and they told me gently and kindly not to hope. You have been in my thoughts all these days too because I know what Quentin meant to you. Not so much from what you have said to me, but, but, what, but from what the dear boy told me so often down here. Though my heart aches at the loss of him, yet I, I cannot but feel a pride and joy in the privilege of having known such a boy. He has done such excellent work since he has been over here. He showed just what could be expected of him all through life. He was one of the few young officers who knew how to handle men, understood them, and was beloved by them. He was so valuable as the officer in charge of training at Field 7 that he was sent to the front only with great reluctance by the commanding officer here, and was to be allowed only to stay a short time in order that he may return to his post here. I have often heard his superior officer say, that it is easy to find good chase pilots, good bombers, and so on, but hard to find men capable of training and sending out good pilots. So your boy has proven his mettle, done his glorious part in this great war, and laid down his life for his ideals. And we who are left behind can only enshrine his memory in our hearts, and how rich that memory is. 
It may help you in your great sorrow to know what he thought about you. You know that he was stationed here nine months with only two intervals of a few weeks where he was recovering from pneumonia and, he went, and, when, he, and when he was in training at Kazol. So I saw a great deal of him and made him feel that my quarters were, were his home whenever he wanted to make use of them. So it came about that he dropped in at all hours and when I was busy, just settled down to read his big poetry book until I had time to talk to him. He had lit, we had little cozy dinners together and many an intimate talk afterward. He was still a boy, though doing men's work, and he was often homesick and very much in love. Many a time the tears would come to his eyes when telling of home, and one of the most touching and beautiful things he said to me concerning you. He was talking of religion and saying how useless the work of the YMCA was amongst boys like himself. He felt the divine yearnings upward very often, but going to church left him cold and indifferent. But he said, quote, I know when I have felt the most truly religious instincts, and that is when I have said my prayers to mother, and more, more often in bed, I think I am kneeling by mother and saying my prayers to her again, and it comforts me, end quote. I learned to love him very much when he was here and tried to be to him at all times what you would have had me be. He so often talked of you to me and used to read me little bits from your letters and was tremendously proud of his father. He, come, he came over at once to talk to me about his serious illness when the news of the operation appeared in the papers. He was terribly restless and disturbed until better news reached him. He had so much heart and so much, much depth of feeling beneath that nonchalance and that bursting youthful assoisance. They tell me he lost his life because of his reckless courage, and it was not the best time, and it was not the first time that he attacked a lone, a lone superior number of Bosch. A colonel who went to the front and brought back the, the authentic news says that Ham Coolidge was much shaken by Quentin's death, but was showing extraordinary devotion and courage in continuing his daily pursuit work in spite of everything. The two were devoted friends, lived together for months, and were rarely seen apart. In writing this letter, letter I have failed utterly to express the unsayable things that lie in the depth of my heart. Words mean so little anyway and I know you will understand and accept the love and sympathy, and believe me, always most sincerely yours. I read a given book. So, uh, you, you can see that uh, Quentin uh, was uh, deeply affected by uh, this woman. And uh, I've tried to find out what became of her. Uh, she became the uh, uh, curator of the Red Cross Museum in Washington, D.C. for a period of time, and uh, then uh, made a couple of trips to Europe, and then uh, disappears completely. So. Uh, it, it uh, reminds me of the uh, concept uh, in loco parentis, which is uh, where an organization uh, acts as the parent of a person when they're there. And uh, that's kind of how I would uh, regard her. Uh, well, at this point, I've used up my time and uh, uh, I put, put the stuff at the end that I could uh, cut off uh, without uh, hurting my presentation. So uh, I wish to thank you. And uh, if anyone wants to make a comment or uh, uh, a question. Yeah, yeah. One question, maybe. I've got a trivial question. I hope it won't. Uh, you have any idea why you're still I'm sorry? Well, uh, do you have any idea why Quentin was automatically? Uh, commissioned first lieutenant 
Um, Resolution second. At that time, um, cadets, uh, when they uh, got the reserve military aviator, uh, when they passed that, they were commissioned first lieutenants. Now that changed from time to time, but that's what it was then. Thank you, Alan, very much.